for today.
You are 
search the world for a love that could fill my heart. Oh, when nothing compares to the wonder of who you are. Holy, all the earth singing. Holy, all the angels cry.
holy this morning. So holy, you're so holy, so worthy, so worthy. Come on, just in your own voice, just tell him right now, you're so worthy.
will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Come on, church. <laughs> Nothing compares to Him. <laughs> Amen. Jesus said when the Pharisees tried to stop the praise of the people, you don't even get it. If they don't cry out, the rocks will. So I'm not going to stop it because He's worthy. Come on, He's worthy. He's worthy of every bit of worship. Come on. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to see you. Hey, it's not raining. Wow, yeah, I'm glad you're in church today. Why don't you turn to two or three people and tell them they're, you're glad that they're sitting beside you. Even if you're not glad, just, tell, just make it up. <laughs> hey, welcome here in person, you are welcome. If you're watching Facebook Live or maybe our YouTube channel on a delay, welcome. We're glad that you are here. And if I haven't met you yet, my name is Tim. I'm the pastor and super excited about this day. And so glad that you're here to celebrate with us what God is doing. So we welcome you. And we hope that you felt that because uh, you are loved and you are welcome. And, and so welcome. If you're a guest, especially if you're a guest, we're going to invite you to do something that we do every week. We'd love to connect with you. And one way that we connect with you is through our connection card. So in the seat back in front of you is one of these. I'll just let you uh, just reach forward and grab that for just a minute. You'll notice there's a pin there as well. Grab the pin and the connection card. Go ahead and put your name and check the box that says first time guest or third time guest or uh, whatever it is. Uh, after three, we just say regular tenor. Take a few moments to fill it out and if you're wondering, why does he want my mailing address? Why does he want my email address? I'll tell you, because that's a good question. If you, send, if you put down a mailing address, I'll like send a letter in the mail to you. Fair enough, right? If you put an email address, I'll, you guessed it, send you an email. So know that your information is safe with us. We just want to be there for you. On the back of the card, there's a place for prayer requests. Now, we want to be praying with you in the way that we... We'll know how to pray with you is that you'll let us know. So take a few moments to write your prayer request down and, um, and just know that we'll be covering you in prayer. As a matter of fact, this Wednesday at 645, there's a prayer small group that meets right in here or a life group that meets right in here. And uh, they're going to be covering you in prayer. And so know that you will be prayed for this week. So if you'll write it down, guess we're glad that you're here. If you're uh, watching on our Facebook Live, let us know. Type something in. So we'll, we'll see that you're there. Um, if you're watching YouTube channel, both those digital formats, you can let us know you're there by going to our website or our um, church app and filling out one of these. Let us know how we can pray for you. We just want to be there. At the end of the service, 
we'll receive these together. Um, as you exit, there'll be some uh, ushers to stand at the door, and they'll receive these, and you can turn them in to the ushers as you leave. And it's also an opportunity for, uh, that we set aside to receive tithe and offering. Now, if you're a guest, we, we don't have any expectation that you'll give anything. Of course, you're welcome to participate in that, but there's like zero pressure. But we, we'd love to hear from you. Also, if you're a guest, um, as you leave in the lobby to the left, there's a welcome table. Some of our connections team will be there, and we would just love to connect with you. Now, let me just say one more thing about the connection card, and then I'll be quiet. On Saturday, March the 18th, we have our uh, annual Spring Spruce Up Day. <clears throat> let me try to say that without a cracked voice. On Saturday, March 18th, we have our annual Spring Spruce Up Day. A little better. We would love, we, we, we've got something for everybody. That's the day we set aside to like put out a bunch of pine straw, paint walls, fix stuff, repair stuff, make it look good, install stuff, deconstruct stuff. So we, there's a place for you. Maybe you, you're just here a couple times. There's a place for you. Here's the good thing. Lunch is provided. But we want to plan for you to be there. So there's something, whether you're an inside person or an outside person, and if you have a specialty skill, let me just kind of clarify that. Specialty skill might be like, you know, uh, you're a plumber or electrician or you're a skilled painter or a sheetrock finisher, something like that, that. If you'll let us know, we'll try to find something that we could use your expertise. Just to clear up the air, bossing people around is not a specialty skill. So just so you'll know. So, hey, come on and join us. 7.30 to noon, lunch is provided. We'll have lunch for you and then you can go. It's going to be an awesome time. We're preparing for spring and for Easter, which is right around the corner. Now, today's a special day. Today's a very special day. Um, we're going to welcome into the church a bunch of new partners that have said yes to uh, this church and said yes to the ministry that they want to be involved in. So as I call your name, I'd like for you to come and stand. And leaders, uh, if you'll come with them as well. And if you're here today and maybe your friend or family member is coming forward, just come on with them. Just come on with them. James and Crystal Olives, Jonathan and Whitney Kendrick, Paul Monroe, Lynette Oden, Brian Pierce, or Brian Prince, sorry, Brian, Brian Prince, um, Monique Stewart, Deborah Stewart, Noah Bennett, Betty Kiley, and Alex Sellers. Just stand across the front, guys. Leaders, if you'll come with them, just stand behind them. You guys can face me. We won't make you face the crowd like a, it's like a, <laughs> it's good to see you. Come on, come on. Let them through. Yeah, come on, Betty. Oh, man, it's so good to see you. Come on, Alex. You just got done with the golf cart out there working, making sure you get in comfortably. Come on, man. So glad that you were here. Come on. Come on, ladies. Come on. Sit across the front here. Paul, let's slide over. There you go. Man, I'm so glad you're here. It's so good to see you. I'm glad you're here. We're excited about this. Now, everyone knows that being involved in a church doesn't, doesn't secure your salvation. We know that. We know that salvation comes by the grace of God through faith in Jesus. But what they're doing is they're saying, listen, I want to advance the kingdom of God. And as a pastor, I believe the best way for you to grow spiritually and for you to advance the kingdom of God is to be connected to a local church. Um, and obviously, you're here, so I'm kind of preaching to the choir. You're here. And one way to step up the game is say, I want to be a partner. And so these uh, uh, young men and young women <laughs> have come today um, to say yes to that. And we've got a partnership covenant that we all agree on. And guys, let me say welcome. We're glad to hear. Some of you are like, I've been waiting on this for like a year. I did this like a year ago, and what took y'all so long to make this happen? We're glad that you are saying yes to him. I believe today's a special day. Behind you is a team of leaders that are here to support you, and what we're going to do in a moment is we're going to pray over you, lay hands on you. For ministry. Because you are made to make a difference. Don't, don't let the enemy convince you any other way. You are made to make a difference. I'm going to rehearse the membership partnership covenant. And as I do, when I get to the end of each of the four, if you agree with that, say, I agree. So our partnership covenant is this. I will protect the unity of my church by acting in love towards others, by refusing to gossip, by following the leadership. If you agree with that, say I agree. 
I will share in the responsibility of my church by praying for its growth and impact, by inviting the unchurched to attend, and by warmly welcoming those who visit. Do you agree with that? Say, I agree. The third thing we do is I'll, I'll share in the ministry of my church by discovering my gifts and talents, by being equipped to serve beside my pastors, and by developing a servant's heart. If you agree with that, say, I agree. And the last thing, the fourth thing is this. I will support the testimony of my church by attending church and small groups faithfully, by living a godly life, and by giving regularly my tithe and offering. If you agree with that, say, I agree. Now, this is an important step, I believe, in your growth and in the impact in this community. Because to, together, we can do more. Church, would you extend your hand? Jamie, if you'll walk along with me, we're going to lay hands on these. And, and, and friends and family, if you'll just step beside them and place your hands on them, we're going to pray over them. Would you agree with us in prayer right now? Father, I thank you for these men and women who've come to say yes. Lord, we lay our hands on them, and we say thank you, Father. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you for sending them to make a difference. Thank you for sending them to use their gifts and talents. Thank you, Lord, that God, that we realize that none of us are perfect, but we're following the perfect one. And so in the name of Jesus, I pray anointing over each one of them to fulfill all the purposes and all the plans that you've set aside for them. You said in your word that you predestined good works for them to do. So I pray for every good work that you've set aside for them to do. Every single one of them will be accomplished, both in this community, in their family, in their life, um, and in their sphere of influence. So God, we pray for an anointing upon them. We pray a strength upon them, and we pray that they would move in the joy of the Lord. Come on. And every in the church said, amen. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you guys. Welcome. <laughs> Love you. Welcome. Welcome, 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 welcome. Noah, welcome. I love you, buddy. Brian, welcome. Jamie, Alex, welcome. God bless you guys. Give me a hand as I go back to their seat one more time. <coughs> now, that's exciting stuff. That's exciting stuff. Grab your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Luke 19. Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Um, you'll notice in the back, there's still tables back there. Those tables, uh, on those tables, uh, are different life groups that you can be part of. And we launched them last week. Be part of a life group. There's something for everybody, for men, for women, for young adults, for married people, for single people. As a matter of fact, tonight, let me just tell you three that are happening tonight. Uh, marriage workout. That's at the Levi and Angela Couch's house. All the information's in the booklet and online. Come, bring your family. The second one uh, tonight is uh, the Chosen Discussion Group. That's at the Vincent's house. Wave there, Pastor Mike. Wave, you can see him. And all the information's here. And, that, and also, Jamie and I are hosting a young adult life group. And so if you're a young adult, if you don't know if you're young, just ask your name. If you're a young adult, we invite you to our house. Um, it's going to be awesome. Um, come on. The information's on the back table. It's on the booklet, it's on the website, or you can see someone that looks like they're young and they might know. So we welcome you. Be part of a life group. Be part of a life group. Oh, this morning, I'm starting a new series. It is, in five Sundays, it'll be Easter. Did I say it right? Five Sundays, it'll be Easter. Someone fact check me real quick. Five Sundays, it'll be Easter, including this one. One, two, three, four, five. And six Sundays, it'll be Easter, including this one. And six Sundays, see? You got to check, you got to check. Six Sundays, it'll be Easter. I've never um, preached a sermon series along the lines of, uh, of, um, of, a, of a timeline, of a timeline. So what I want to do, for the Lord's light of my heart, is to back up um, the week before Jesus' crucifixion and look at Christ. What is he saying? What is he doing? What is he experiencing? What does it mean for us? What does it mean for a New Testament believer? And that he would be glorified and he would be exalted and he would get praise and glory. And so we're going to start with um, Passover 
day. I know it's not Passover day, but we're going to start there because that's the week before, the week of. In Luke chapter 19, here it is, several verses. I'll read aloud. You can follow on the screen behind me. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent went ahead and found it just as they had been told. As they were untying the colt, his owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As they went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. They knew who he was. Here's what they said. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. In other words, tell them to shut up. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the timing of God's coming to you. So there we are. A few days before the trial and crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus had stated many times that his time had not yet come. Now his time had come. He was aware, fully aware of who he was and what he was to do. He understands that. And you, you can, I want you to watch him over the next few weeks with a laser beam focus and full understanding of what is ahead of him. He's not blindsided. He's not caught off guard. He, he understands what's happening. Each word, each action calculated. Each uh, action completed with a purpose. As we study the next few weeks, I'm going to follow the chronological order. Now, one of the problems with doing that is there are a few things that some scholars disagree on which day it happened. When that happens, we say, okay, sometimes the exact timing is significant, and sometimes the point is, why did it happen? Right? And so I'll try to point out the ones that I see as significant in, in, in the timing that they happened. And if you read a timeline that says, oh, that happened on Monday, not Sunday, or Tuesday, not, not Monday, don't sweat it, right? Don't sweat it. However, there are some events where the timing is very important, and the day is very important, and his arrival is one of those. I want you to imagine a scene with me. There's a young doctor, has a family, three kids and a wife. He volunteers to take a very dangerous assignment, six months working overseas in a place where there's an epidemic of a rare disease breaking out. And there's great hostility towards those from the outside. He takes the assignment because nobody else with his special training was willing to go. So the months pass by slowly. The kids miss their dad. The wife does a valiant job holding things together, acting as mom and dad. And the day of his return approaches. They knew he was coming. The uh, Uber rolls out front. Dad jumps out of the car, 
The kids run out and just tackle their dad. His face is sunken in a little bit. He'd lost some weight. His beard is covering some of his uh, uh, frailness. And they just wrestle with dad on the ground. So good to see you, daddy. So good to see you. And he's hugging and kissing them. And mom's back there waiting patiently. He jumps up for the kids, hugs her, kisses her, and says, it's so good to see you. It's so good to be back. I want you to look for a moment in the eyes of that young doctor because there's a message there. If you can see it, if you can feel it, you will know a little something of what Jesus must have felt like when he rode into Jerusalem. What you see in his eyes, but what his family does not yet know. He caught the disease, he went to heal, and he has one week to live. Number one, Jesus came to untie the tied up. He came to untie the tied up. Jesus came to untie the tied up. So he's in this village. He goes, he says, look, guys, I need you to go find me a donkey, a colt. It'll be tied up when you find it. If somebody asks you, hey, who do you think you are? <laughs> Say to them, hey, the master has need of it. So apparently, Jesus had followers inside the town that would be willing to help. Jesus enters into the city. He's entering into Jerusalem. He sends the disciples with specific instructions. He's very intentional. This is a big point. He's very calculated. I counted 30, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Six, seven verses about a donkey in one gospel. Very specific instructions. Seven verses. That is not there by accident. Jesus was there fulfilling a prophecy. Zechariah 9 9 says this Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See. Can't you see? Your king, he comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. This is very intentional. There's seven verses in that gospel alone because the writer wants us to know this wasn't just something that happened. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing and he rides in to fulfill Zechariah 9.9. Zechariah says, your king has arrived. You'll know when he comes riding on a foul of a donkey. Your righteous and victorious king has come. And Jesus is saying, I am here for you. I am here for you. And I want you to know that he's here for you today. He's here for your family. The king has come. He's righteous. He's victorious. And he's here to advance his kingdom in your life and through your life. He is here to defeat all of your foes and to bring complete and total victory. Don't miss him. <laughs> Don't miss him. Don't miss him just because he's riding on a borrowed donkey. Don't miss him. He's here to bring you victory. Do you believe that? His disciples were instructed to untie the donkey. Now, I don't want to make a big deal out of something that may not be a big deal, but I'm, I just don't want to ignore that for a second. The donkey was all tied up. Jesus came to untie the tied up. Jesus came to untie the tied up. And if you've grown up hearing this word repentance, it, fe it can feel like a negative word. It can feel like you're a horrible, horrible person and uh, you just need somebody to help you with your horrible, horrible life. But I want you to take a different view of that word, repentance. Repentance is there to help us. Repentance is there because God says, I have better. I, 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 that's, that's not my best for you. You're, you're, you're selling yourself short. You're, you, you're all tied up over here, and I got better stuff for you. It is 
one of the most difficult situations to look in from the outside. When you see a young lady in a relationship with a man that's manipulative, I can't say the word manipulative, (laughs) controlling, abusive, you so much want her to get out and get away. You, You want her to leave that because you know there's better for her. And what she's involved in currently is destructive. It's hurting her. And you want her to leave that relationship. To get out, get away for her own safety. Why? Because God has better for her. And you know it. That's what Jesus is offering. He says, I got better for you. I got better for you. Man, I got better for you. He, come, he came to untie the tied up. Our purpose is to go into all the world and make disciples. And we celebrate that two weeks ago, we were able to give $17,034.02 outside these doors that we set aside an entire week's offering. Now, for those of you doing a little math, you say, man, that's a huge, huge budget. Can I tell you, that was about 125% bigger (laughs) than a a normal week. (laughs) So we did it. We're sending, but we're not just sending, we're going people. We're to go into all the world. We're not called, listen, listen very carefully. We're not called to make decisions for Christ. We're called to make disciples. Don't be confused because both those words start with a letter D. (laughs) They're not the same. And I'm sure that I have used that phrase before. And I'm not saying it's a bad phrase, decision for Christ. But what I think I would like to do is replace that with I have surrendered to Christ. That's, I like that better. I have surrendered to Christ. My whole life is surrendered to Him. When you do that, He starts untying every part of you that's all tied up. When he, when, when he loses, when He loosens you up, you're free to follow Him. You're free to follow Him. Please don't stop appreciating your salvation. Don't stop letting Him work. He has more and, and better. Jesus walks into the temple. This is in Luke 4. This is before this happens. And he said, I'm telling you why I'm here. Luke chapter 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Okay. Can, can I... Just talk to you for a moment. Some of y'all are like, oh, you better brace yourself, you know. I just want to talk to you for a minute. I realize it's not 1980. Some of y'all think it might be, but it's not 1980. I grew up in the 80s. The best decade ever. Not the 70s like some of y'all hippies. Just kidding. Just kidding. I grew up in an environment where we, were at, we were went to church three times a week. We just did. It was, it was, listen, I'm not beating anybody up. I was having a conversation with Steve the other day about this. He brought it up, about this very thing. We, there wasn't a conflict with travel ball and so, that, all those stuff. And, and, and they just... So I was, we were just there. We were there. I thought as a kid, this is funny, at least I think it's funny. I thought as a kid that the devil put that television show, The Six Million Dollar Man, on TV on Sunday night to keep people out of church. I was convinced. Because we didn't have no DVDs recorded or nothing. We could, we, you missed it, you missed it. And I, I never got to hardly watch The Six Million Dollar Man. We will be the bionic man. Come on, Steve Austin. And I thought that was a plan of the enemy because I just loved the show. And about twice a year I could watch it. I just loved it. But we were there. We're in a crisis in this country. Let me just, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm, I'm exhorting you for a moment. We're in a crisis. The new trend, when Barna polls uh, uh, um, people who uh, claim to be Christians, 
that their definition of regular church attendance is one service a month. That's the new, def, that's the new working, that's the new, the new line of which we work from. Every alarm bell in your spirit should go, be going off. The, the, the other pattern produced some pretty intense disciples and followers of Jesus. It's hard to make a disciple when there's 90 minutes a week of interaction once a month. Now look, I don't know if you gave me permission to tell you this, but I'm telling you, I'm not here to beat you up. I'm here to exhort you, number one, but to also raise an alarm. I realize that the, the function of the church can exist in small groups like tonight, and it will, right? So not everyone has to be in the same room at the same time, right? By design. But what I'm telling you is you are paddling upstream. You are paddling upstream. And I want you to know I need your help. I desperately need your help. We're battling a culture that's disconnected, isolated, has crept its way into the, every facet of our of our. Uh, 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 of, of our culture, and the downshot, it's, it's more difficult to get things done. Uh, um, people are still used to doing, they got disconnected, and, and, and they got convinced that everything's from home now. Each of you has a gift set that's given by God, by design, that's critical to the function of the body of Christ. You need to believe that, first of all, and you need to Discover that. If you find yourself in a mode, for whatever reason, that's showing up once in a while only, what I would say to you is, please know that you are needed. Please know that you have something valuable to offer the kingdom. And if I have not done a good job of convincing you of that or training you, I apologize. And I'm doubling down in 2023 to say, I want to do everything I can to equip you to be the body of Christ that you were made to be. The characteristics of the New Testament churches, they worship freely. Some of them lost their lives. Two, they advanced the kingdom. Think about this. Jesus uh, uh, um, says to a group of about 12, maybe 100 people, he said, look, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Every, every, and, and, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the, the planet. Every, every person you can find walking on the planet. 2,100 years ago, without any public transportation, without anything but animals to take, they, they spread the gospel in their remaining lifetime to the known population of the world. <laughs> don't tell me that he can't do the impossible. Don't tell me he can't do it. And they remained flexible. Oh my goodness. Sometimes when I go to the gym, I just got to stretch out a lot because I'm not as flexible as I used to be. Oh, you young people. You think you'll be like a rubber band the rest of your life. And you can just go run a 100-meter dash straight out of the breakfast table. Well, your time's coming. <laughs> you got to remain flexible. you got to remain flexible. Church, remain flexible. Don't get so tied down to what happened yesterday. Maybe God wants you to do the same of uh, what you did yesterday. But remain flexible. Jesus unties. They're tied up. Number two, it was Lamb Selection Day. On the 10th day of the month, Nisan, was Lamb Selection Day. 1,500 years, the Jewish nation selected their lamb for the Passover on the 10th day of the first month on their calendar. Now, here's another significant timing moment. Exodus 12 gives us some direction. So we're backing up. Genesis, Exodus. They had left um, Egypt. And, or, or they're getting ready to leave Egypt. God gives them marching orders. Here's what will help you escape 
the coming doom. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share with the nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. So they're, they're picking, kind of like maybe uh, uh, picking a, a, a Thanksgiving turkey. What size do you need, right? Okay. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. I can promise you if they had 20-year-old males in their house, they're getting an extra large one. I just, from personal experience. The, the animals you choose must be your old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month. Now pay attention. The 14th day of the month. When all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Now, according to Exodus chapter 12, the 10th day of the first month, every leader of the house was to select a lamb that was the right size for their family to eat for the Passover meal. Passover was, was, was then. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem on Passover. It was one of the three major holidays that all God-fearing Jews were required, really, to come to Jerusalem to celebrate. Year old uh, lamb. And then on the 14th day, the lamb would be slaughtered. Okay. It was no coincidence that Jesus rode in to Jerusalem on the day that he rode in. So he's got Zechariah's donkey, right? He's riding in. All the pilgrims were anxiously making their way to the city to pick out the lamb. This was the day. From the flocks, the Sadducees had bread and they raised for this occasion. They knew it was coming. They bred them a year ago. Here they are, without spot, without blemish. The writers of the New Testament saw this clearly. Let me read you seven quick verses. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Hebrews 7, 27. He sacrificed for sins once and for all when he offered himself. Hebrews 9, 28. Christ was sacrificed to take away the sins of many people. John 1, 29. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 1 Peter 1.19, you're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without spot or blemish. In the book of Revelation, at least 20 times, it refers to Christ as the lamb. Revelation 5.6 says this, then I saw a lamb looking as if he had been slain, standing in the center of the throne. Revelation 12.11, they overcame by the blood of the lamb. Genesis 22.8, let's go back Old Testament. The, um, God himself will provide a, Lamb. Revelation 5.12. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. So there he is. Christ. The Passover Lamb. And just to make sure we get it. God sends his son into Jerusalem. On the very day. The Jewish people will be picking their Lamb. For the last 1500 years. What a God of detail and precision. The date and time have been fixed since the foundation of the world. Everything was planned as this, with the finest details. The crowd had hoped he was coming to be their warrior king. God had a different battle plan. They were looking for a political leader to reestablish the throne of David militarily, politically. He said, I come for the kingdom. Oh, it's way bigger than these puny, little, earthly kingdoms. During the next four days, The lambs would be presented daily in the temple where everyone could see them, allowing them to be inspected by the people. Jewish historians cite that the lambs during that time 
would come from Bethlehem. Who was it the angels appeared to? The shepherds tending the sheep in their flocks just outside of. And they were brought into Jerusalem through a gate called the Sheep Gate. Picking up on that one, the, the sheep came in the sheep gate. At that time, only the sheep from Bethlehem that had been raised specifically and especially for this purpose were allowed for selection. Jesus enters Jerusalem along with a Passover lamb through the sheep gate. On Zechariah's donkey. Can't you see it? He's saying, here I am. You're victorious king. I'm the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. What a beautiful picture. His hour was now. Spotless Lamb. Verse 35, Luke 19 says, they brought it to Jesus, the, the donkey, threw their cloak on the colt, put, it, uh, put Jesus on it. As he went along, oh, let me just say this. Uh, Luke is clear that this donkey had never been ridden before. I'm not an animal expert. I rode a horse like three times, but I know this. You don't just jump on an animal without that animal. I don't without someone working with it first. I mean, you, you can do that if you, maybe you're one of those horse people and you can do. He has authority over every creation. I want you to see all this. He went along, uh, as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they'd seen. They knew he was a miracle-working prophet. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory uh, to the highest. So this irritated the Pharisees. They said, stop him, Jesus. He said, if I tell them to keep quiet, the stones will cry out. What is the most inanimate, lifeless, dead object you can think of? You ever heard this statement? It's kind of a derogatory statement. You're about as dumb as a rock. Yeah. Now, now I'm not saying that to you. I'm just saying maybe, maybe you heard that in boot camp or something. I don't know. It's the most lifeless thing you can think of. What, what Jesus said, I'll... How about a stone? The glory of God, so significant and so amazing and so awe-inspiring and so beautiful that creation will worship the Creator and no man can stop it, no law can stop it, no force can stop it, no elected official no dictator can stop it. No government or nation can stop it. No legislation can stop it. No religion can stop it. No conspiracy or scheme or plot or plan can stop it. God will be worshipped. <clears throat> Jesus is saying very intentionally, here I am. Here I am. All this morning, I pray that God would, would release just an atmosphere and a spirit of praise and worship. That we would be in awe of who he is. That we'd be in wonder. L listen, listen to me. You got enough problems. Be in awe and wonder of who he is. Be in awe and wonder of who he is. Don't get so busy and so uptight. That you, you can't appreciate the awe and the wonder of who he is. Be in awe. Don't lose your awe and your wonder. When you come to church, like, just let your proverbial hair down. 
Just let it fly. Come on, somebody. The, the God of the universe, he's coming in Jerusalem on a donkey through the sheep gate as the Passover lamb. He's saying, here I am. Don't try to stop that praise because you, you think you can stop it. Interesting factoid, all through church history, every time the gospel was squished, it just spread out more. Every time it was tried to be stopped, it, it became more contagious. Lamb selection day. Will, will you let him be your lamb? Will you let him be your sacrifice? Will you let him? What about you? I don't know all of you. Is he, is he your sacrificial lamb? Have you said, Jesus, I surrender everything to you? I'm everything. I surrender everything to you. Now, there's a tension right now because some of you have some very painful things right here at this intersection. You're, you're like, I, I don't know if I can let go of that. It's become almost embedded in you. It's become so painful. And Jesus is saying, I, I want to untie you and release you with freedom to enjoy me and to enjoy why I came. Do you have the courage to surrender everything? So there he is, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, coming into Jerusalem on Lamb Selection Day. And as he comes in, there's an interesting dynamic. Everyone's celebrating, except the Pharisees, they're just mad. I think they were always mad about something. They're celebrating. This is our time. This is our hour. And Jesus is weeping. He's weeping. As they approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. He said, even if you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, if you'd just known that, now it's hidden from your eyes. You, you can't see it. And then, he, and then he says, there's a day coming when your enemies will build an embankment against you. They're going to circle you on every side and dash you to the ground. And your children within the walls. They'll destroy this place. Because you didn't recognize the time of God's coming. So it was a both historical prophetic word and a spiritually prophetic word. Seventy years from that, Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, and all that was fulfilled. But spiritually, even bigger than that, is, is they, they were being destroyed with, from within because they, they gotten, they, they'd become uh, um, 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 they couldn't see Jesus for who he was. They tried to make him into their personal Jesus. So I have mixed emotions about that phrase. Because he is personal. He's personal. And he's a savior for you. That's good. The tension over here. He's my personal Jesus, therefore I shape him into what I want. That's a problem. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. I don't care who says what, he doesn't change. Call me what you want, he doesn't change. He's not, he's not growing. He's not realizing anything. He hasn't come to any recent conclusions. He, he ha, he, he's not he, uh, uh, suddenly infused with a, with a new uh, uh, way of thinking. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Here's the good news. You can bake on that. So, is he personal? But if I try to make him something that he's not, what I say I have, I actually have no part of. I do not have what I claim to have. And there's a rub right now with that whole phrase. So, I'm happy about it, 
and I'm sad about it. <laughs> right? So if you say, he's my personal Jesus, I'm happy about that. As long as you understand if something needs to change, it's not him. So we become <laughs> molded and shaped into his image. We don't shape him into our image. And if we're not careful, what happens is our experience in our culture and all blah, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll project that over this book and read it in a way that's not supposed to be read. Or we'll just assume, because I feel something, that Jesus must certainly feel it. And then, you know, it takes the faith of a child to believe and get saved. And it takes someone with a PhD in philosophy to talk you out of it. Like, it doesn't even make sense, right? And so you're thinking, okay, Jesus, same yesterday, today, and forever. On Lamb Selection Day, he's my Savior. And whatever he says goes. And I completely surrender to that. So there's Jesus. He's weeping for the lost. It's the second occasion. Come on, team. Second occasion that Jesus wept. The first was at the tomb of Lazarus, right? There he wept quietly. It was, it was a quiet, it wasn't a... But here he utters a loud lamentation, like the mourning over the dead. It's a, it's a, it's a crying out. He's moved. He was like the prophet Jeremiah who wept bitterly over the destruction of Jerusalem. Jonah looked over Nineveh and hoped it would be destroyed while Jesus was looking over Jerusalem because it had destroyed itself from within. No matter where Jesus looked, he saw reason for weeping. Listen to me. If he looked back, he saw a nation that had wasted its opportunities and had been ignorant of their time of visitation. They missed it. If he looked from within... He saw spiritual ignorance and blindness in the hearts of the people. They should have known who he was. How else can you? I mean, he's announcing it 40, 100 ways. He's, who else is healing the sick? Who else is raising the dead? One of the funniest scriptures in the Bible, to me, is when after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the Pharisees plotted to kill them both. And I'm thinking, wait, what? You can't hurt a man who raises the dead. <laughs> you can't hurt a man who raises the dead. So they plot to kill them both. Isn't, I don't know, isn't that funny to you? Like, how ironic is that? As he looked around, listen, he saw activity. Religious activity that was accomplishing very little. The temple had become a den of thieves. We'll talk about that in a few days. Remember, he goes in, clears that mess out. The religious leaders were out to kill him. The city was filled with pilgrims celebrating a festival. Their hearts, the people, were heavy with sin and life burdens. He looks ahead, and he saw what would happen in 70 years. In AD 70, the Romans would come in and in a siege of 143 days, kill 600,000 Jews, take thousands more captive, destroy the temple and the city. Why did it happen? Because the people didn't know that it was their time of visitation. And they were destroyed. And he realizes that he's weeping. He's a weeping lamb. He's not weeping because what he's facing. He's not weeping. He's willfully moving towards his purpose. We, we see that Jesus, his mercy, we see him in mercy. He's, 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 he's moved tenderly. Now, I, I, I don't know how tender my heart would be if I realized a whole bunch of them had a hit out on my life. And apparently, the price is about 30 pieces of silver. Not a big price tag. I'm not sure how tender I would feel. He feels sorrow for the situation. This doesn't mean... 
that his sovereign plan has been wrecked on the rocks of humanity. It, it means that Jesus is more emotionally complex than we think he is. It means that he really feels sorrow for the situation. No doubt, there's an inner peace that he has. He has inner peace, knowing the Father's in control, and that God's wise purposes will come to pass. That doesn't mean you can't cry. In fact, on the contrary, I appeal to you, pray that God would give you tears. Pray that God would give you tears. There's so much pain in the world. So much suffering. Pray that you would be tenderly moved. We stand before the judge, and Jesus asks, how did you feel about the suffering around you? I don't think you're going to feel really good about saying, I saw how a lot of people brought suffering upon themselves because of their foolishness. I don't think that would be what you'd want to say. <laughs> I think you'd want to say, I had compassion. The trouble I have here personally is I can't do everything about everything. Right? You, you, and we're in the same boat together, right? I can't do, I don't know if I can do anything about that or about this. That doesn't mean I can't have compassion and be moved. Be careful not to isolate yourself so much over things that are beyond your control that you lose sensitivity. That, that's what I'm trying to say. 50,000 people have died because of the earthquake? I've never seen a one of them. I don't, I don't live over there. That doesn't mean I shouldn't be moved with some kind of compassion. Maybe you need to repent of hardness. Jesus' mercy was self-denying. Not ultimately, there was a great reward, but he was laying his life down. It was a very painful pilgrimage. In the next part, you know the story. He's moving towards suffering, towards pain. He's entering Jerusalem to die. He had told him in the previous chapter, Luke 18, we're going to Jerusalem, the Son of Man will be delivered, and they will kill him. You know what they said? Can I sit on the right or the left? It's, it's in there. Jesus is going, oh my word. You people. Knuckleheads. This is the meaning of self-denial. This is the way we follow Jesus. Denying ourselves. We, we see a need. Jesus saw a need. Uh, uh, sin in the world. Broken bodies and the misery of hell, we, we move with Jesus towards the need. Whatever cost, whatever, the, whatever requires, we deny ourselves the comforts and securities and the ease of avoiding other people's pain. We cannot do that. We embrace it. Jesus' tears were not just some emotional expression. He was moved with a need. And His mercy has intentions that are to help. He's not just crying in the corner. He's tenderly moved with self-denial, but he moves towards the need with an intention to help. Mercy is helpful. So, for all you non-feelers, pray that you would feel. For all you weeping willows, Pray that that would move you to action. Right? It doesn't just feel, it does something. It, 
it denies itself. It, it's, it's moving to a place where, where there is help provided. And Jesus was doing that. He's moving to provide help. Even though he saw them and went, oh no, he's moving towards help. My question, what will it be for you? How are you doing in ministries of mercy? How are you, your roommate, your housemate, your family, how are you doing in mercy? How's your family doing? What is tenderly moving you these days? Can I tell you, there's a plot on your emotions to make you hardened and frustrated all the time that you won't see a real need to move and do it. Some of you need to turn the TV off, turn the stinking radio off. You get bombard your brain all day and it just makes you hard. There's a movement towards pain or suffering or misery or loss or sadness. That means denying yourself in the short run, but it multiplies joy in the long run because there's a reward on the other side. So there we see Jesus preparing to enter Jerusalem. Prepare and make way for the Lord. Come on. Let, 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 let what moves Jesus move you. Maybe you're here today and he is not your sacrificial lamb. In other words, you haven't surrendered everything to him. Maybe you prayed a prayer one time, but if you examined your life, you'd say, yes, there's no relationship with God. I, I'm not surrendered to him. Today's your day. Pick up your cross and follow Jesus. Jesus, the one who weeps over your destruction, the one who comes with a plan to help you out of your destruction, and he's coming with purpose and intention and with power. No one takes my life, he says, I lay it down. Don't you know I could call legions of angels and wipe you off the map? But I freely lay it down. Do you see him? Here he is, coming into Jerusalem, riding on Zechariah's prophetic donkey. Through the sheep gate, all the Passover lambs are being chosen. And he's saying, here I am. Come on, who will choose me? Who will choose me? Whosoever will, right? Whosoever will. Uh, if, you, if you lay down, your, uh, whosoever will, I'm, I'm for you and you, I'm for all of you. I'm for you, all of you, for everyone. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Isn't he beautiful? <laughs> Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he an awesome God? If you're here today, you say, Tim, I need to surrender. To him. I need to surrender to him. I need to surrender to him. If that's you, on the count of three, just wave at me. Say, Tim, pray for me. I need to surrender to him. That's what I need. I need to surrender to him. I haven't been. I haven't been. He knows that I know it. There's no surrender. But today, I want to surrender. If that's you, and you say, I, I want to surrender everything to him. On the count of three, just wave at me. I want to pray for you. Tim, include me in that prayer when you pray. One, I want to surrender to him today. Two, I came in the door not surrendered, but I want to surrender. That's you on the count of three. Just wave. Three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. I see it, buddy. I see it, brother. Yeah, I see it. Sister on the end. I see that. Surrender to him. What a beautiful Savior we have. What a beautiful Savior we have. What a beautiful Savior. Would you stand all across this place? What is my takeaway? Number one, I'm going to pray in a moment. Prayer of surrender. Right? Number two, that God would release in us just this spirit of praise and worship. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah, we don't have, like, yeah, just like a kid, just like, I'm going to praise God. Yeah. And that we would move in tender mercy towards pain and towards difficulty and towards, we'd move towards it. With a thought of helping. We just reflect on that. Put your mind on Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, speak to us now. Show us the direction we should take. Would you pray that now? Would you pray? Show us the direction we should take, Holy Spirit. Show us what we should do with what we've heard. Show us what we should do with what we've heard. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you raised your hand, or you should have, in a moment, I'm going to give you opportunity just to praise Him, just to surrender to Him. If, if you say, let me tell you what happened to me this week. God revealed a place in my life that He just needed more surrender in. And I just wept before Him. God, it's, I give it to you. I'm sorry. Maybe you're here today and you're like, David, search my heart, God. See if there be any wicked way in me. If there's anything that I'm tied up with, untie me. Right. Let him move you with tender mercy. I'm just going to release this place to worship and praise. If you want special prayer, there'll be some leaders standing up. They'll be facing you so you'll know. We'll come pray for you. If you'd just rather respond and just come and lay at the altar or lift your hands at your seat and worship and surrender. Let's pray a prayer of surrender. What can we together? Can we right now? And then we're just going to sing to him. Pray this with me. I'm, I'm going to just help you. Might be good if we all pray this. Say, dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus as my sacrificial lamb. I believe Jesus is the son of God that he was crucified and rose from the dead. I understand. I've blown it. I'm a sinner. And I ask for mercy. By faith, I believe that Jesus was my substitute. I should have died, but he died in my place. Thank you for mercy. Thank you, Jesus. I just begin to worship him. Prayer team's coming now. If you want to respond through worship prayer, these altars are open. If you want to come kneel, stand, sit in the presence of God, if you want special prayer, come see one of these that are standing. Come on, let's worship together. Let's be in awe of him. Let's be in awe of him.
he's so worthy. <laughs> I got a word for you. Jesus says, enjoy me. Enjoy me. He wants you to enjoy him. Maybe you've never heard that. Maybe you feel like it's just got to all be grin and bear it and get through. Jesus says, enjoy me. Enjoy me. Enjoy me. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for leading us. Thank you. It's good to see sister bass player over here. All the way from Gardendale, Alabama. I just love it, man. We just got kids everywhere. Come leading us, man. That's awesome. Where's her dad? Here he is. That's my baby girl. First time she's playing this morning. Yeah. A lot of hard work. Pastor John and Joni and Pastor Lisa have been working with her. It's not all grin and bear it. Enjoy him. When you leave, there'll be ushers at the door to receive your connection card. If you're a guest, we'd love to have you stop by our welcome center. And, and just, we got a little gift for you if you'd like and connect with you. But drop that off. Also, the uh, Spring Spruce update. Let us know. Like, don't just check the box. You've got to put your name so we'll know who to, like, like include. And if, you, if, if your neighbor's not going to go, just put their name down and sign them up anyways. And then we'll just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But there's something for everybody. Can I pray a blessing over you? Before I do that, I want you to read the next few weeks. I want you to read about the last week of Jesus' life. Let's read together. Let's grow together. Let's see what the Holy Spirit will show us and what it'll do and solidify our faith. Come on. Isn't that good when you just dig a little bit and see the nuggets the Word of God will have for us? Amen. Father, I pray blessing of your people. I pray that you bless them coming and going. You bless them. Um, um, I pray that you bless their businesses small businesses, those who are managers and work off commissions, I pray that you bless them with favor and sales. Give them wisdom for hiring, the right people. Lord, I pray for advancement of your people. I pray for promotion. God, I pray that you would bless us with tender hearts that are broken for what breaks your heart. God, that we could have the joy of the Lord and still cry. Lord, we could be moved with hearts of compassion over suffering and pain. But, Lord, we can still have the assurance of our salvation and the joy of the Lord. So I pray that over your people. I pray that you would prepare our hearts for uh, Passion Week, that this Easter would be the most significant. And, God, we say thank you for being our Passover lamb. Thank you for our Passover lamb, that you are the perfect one without spot or blemish. I pray that your people would go in the joy of the Lord. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. God bless you.